Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. We are here today uh, for SBX 2021 to talk about world building and new futures. What happens when we dare to imagine what could be in the future? Um, my name is Alice Santos. I am a volunteer programmer and uh, I'm sorry, volunteer coordinator and programming coordinator for uh, CXC and SPX. Um, and we have some amazing guests today that I'm so excited can join us. So if you'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself so we can get started. Uh, I'll go first. Um, uh, I'm Casey Nowak. Uh, uh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote and drew Girl Town. It was a collection of stories that came out in 2018. Uh, right now, I post comics to my Patreon. I'm working on a big sci-fi comic called Body Seed right now. And a smaller uh, sci-fi comic called Bravo. So awesome. yeah, that's me. Thank you. And then I think we, we can go, let's say counterclockwise. Maki, if you'd like to go. Hey, I'm Maki Nero. I'm a illustrator, cartoonist, and science communicator. Um, these days, um, I guess most recently, uh, I was part of two anthologies, one about uh, those are six series of short stories from Guantanamo Bay Prison, and uh, another called Flash Forward, which is kind of relevant to this talk, which is uh, a series of short comics about possible futures on a variety of topics from art to um, what does the justice system look like in space, which is the chapter I did. Awesome, thank you. Alyssa? Hi, I'm Alyssa Sala. Um, I work, uh, well, a lot of my world building stuff is in my um, anthology comics, my short form stories in the uh, bonfire, on, bonfire anthology um, that we do every year except for this weird COVID year. Um, but uh, and then I also have a um, book coming out, a graphic novel called uh, Weeaboo. I'm uh, really excited for coming out in November. And um, I've also worked on Sleepless with uh, Layla Del Duca and Sarah Vaughn, uh, which is like a fantasy um, series. Um, it came out in 11 chapters or 11 like floppies and collected in no trade um, that I did editorial and colors on that was really fun. We got to make a really cool uh, like fantasy Mediterranean world uh, out of that. Yeah. That's super cool. Thank you so much. And then Kevin. Hi, I'm Kevin Chap. Um, they, them. Um, I've done um, I guess like one of my first big books was called Fuji Perf that Uncivilized Books put out in 2017. And then I've just finished a serialized comic called Four Years, um, which I've self-published. And um, I also co-published the Leyline series with Elle Nichols that um, Elle and I sort of jammed together on a split issue, this most recent uh, one where I did uh, a comic about Project Runway. Um, the theme of ley lines is having cartoonists make comics that are inspired or uh, interact with other kinds of art. So I thought that my love of uh, Project Runway as a show and its relationship to the fashion industry was and my love of Tim Gunn. <laughs> but uh, yeah, happy to be here with everybody. Fantastic, thank you so much. All right, uh, so I thought that we could get started with um, a very broad question, which is, where do you start? By that, I mean, um, when you start constructing a hypothetical future, what is the initial spark that gets things moving? Um, some folks start with a specific dynamic or question, or sometimes this universe sort of presents itself fully formed. So I'd love to know more about individually how you approach those beginnings? Uh, well, more often than not, I watch some terrible sci-fi um, and then I try to do a good version of it. That sounds mean. Or I try, I'm like, <laughs> I'll get like, I'll get really unsatisfied by um, a sci-fi thing. Uh, like, this is, I've said this on like every panel I've been on for the last like three years, but um, 
probably the story I'm most known for is called Diana's Electric Tongue. It's about a girl who has a robot boyfriend. And I wrote that after I watched Ex Machina um, with so much hope in my heart because <laughs> the trailer was cool. And I was like, is, is this gonna go where I think it's gonna go? Is this gonna be interesting? And then it was like, not interesting. It was just kind of like cynical and horny and there's nothing wrong with horny, but like not in a fun way and like a, I don't know, a weird way. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so that's usually where I start from where I'm like oh god it feels like you almost got it um and I usually just iterate on things that I that would be the nice and humble way to say it I just iterate on the things that I wish were better <laughs> um yeah that's mostly it very cool yeah, I can appreciate looking at something and going, I like what you were possibly trying to do. Mm -hmm. Also, I can do it so much better than that. Yeah, I just like, <laughs> so sure. I always, my expectations are just always so like let down in so many like situations, like something like Passengers, that stupid movie with Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence that was just like complete weird garbage and had this huge sci-fi budget like you could have done anything dude I don't know <laughs> is that the one with the like cryo sleep mm -hmm. uh, and he wakes her up <laughs> against <bad>. her will <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's terrible <laughs> they could have made it into like a serial killer thing but <laughs> maybe I don't know. <laughs> and yet here we are. <laughs> Smocky, I'm particularly interested in your response to this question because as a science educator, um, you sort of start from a different vantage point, I think, than some folks do. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I don't really do a lot of fiction. Um, so the story in Flash Forward was kind of, uh, well, I haven't done fiction in a while. I have a defunct webcomic that's also somewhat you know, I like to call it secret sci-fi because it's sort of like near future where, you know, until, you know, there were only like a few points where I kind of like dropped some things where like, you know, lower Manhattan is apparently flooded. Um, like in this like Venice now with a bunch of gondola cabs going around. And until like those kind of things kind of, you know, are kind of, I slyly threw those in, you would think it was set in present day. Um, but yeah, so like I, I was, um, I mean, I was fortunate in that, like, for Flash Forward, we were, you were given prompts and a whole podcast episode uh, to base things on. So I listened to the episode and, you know, it talked about a lot of the things covered in there. And then I kind of just, like, looked and, like, you know, filled in the gaps, really. Like, okay, so, like, you know, this is something that, this is a justice system, restorative justice Um you know, is something that could be picked up in space because, you know, you're in space, it's expensive to get to and from space. You can't just throw people in jail because there's limited space in, you know, the stations and stuff and you need people to work. Um, so the idea was that, you know, um, the justice system in space would be much more, you know, reconciliatory and people would work out their problems and come to solutions uh, rather than, you know, just sending people back to Earth, which is very costly. Um, and so I kind of like thought about that and, you know, what, oh, like what else would happen and what else, what, what other things are going on in this, you know, in this possible future? And the, the you know, the, the conflict of the story is that like, yes, there's, you know, this system stuff in space and they're generally happy with it and it's been going for generations, but um, Earth problems basically come up and give the main characters problems. Um, you know, basically there's a there's a there's an accident and it causes a literally a corporate um, corporate skirmish between corporate uh, paramilitary groups. Um, I couldn't call them Amazon and uh, <laughs> it on. It's basically like you know, I couldn't call them Amazon and Google, but like you know that's pretty much who there are proxies for. Um, and there's a very thinly veiled uh, Elon Musk character in the comic. Um, but it's kind of like, okay, so like what happens when, you know, you have this future that's, you know, kind of okay. And, 
you know, they're working things out, but, you know, you have the, the old problems from Earth following them up. I think that's a really fun part about world building, especially if you're kind of focusing or like bringing reality into it is like you, you always kind of like use your surroundings and your like what you're thinking about in your own world to influence like the world that you create like especially with like you said you wanted to like see like the you wanted it to be like amazon coming in and doing that and i i, don't know, I think that's like one of the fun parts about world building it's like expanding on like the world you currently live in Yeah, and it's, it kind of became with uh, Jeff Bezos going to space. It's <laughs> I, I worry that it's quickly becoming more reality than sci-fi uh, now because you know the worry is that like okay when corporations get into space, who's going to stop them from doing anything? Um, you know, so yeah, maybe there will be corporate turf wars with paramilitary groups. You know, paramilitary proxies on the moon or on whatever asteroids they want to mine, things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, the the idea of uh, Earth problems becoming sort of everyone's problems, and Alyssa, some of what you spoke of as well about um, integrating those aspects of real life really stuck out in all of your work. Uh, there are some experiences that are universal, and that doesn't matter it doesn't matter whether it's happening in space, it doesn't matter if it's happening underneath the ground, uh, no matter where you are, we're going to experience love and, and loss and a lot of these intense feelings. And so um, I would love to hear more about how some of that interplays with your work. Uh, Kevin, in particular, I was thinking about pretty much all of Future Perf, which is these romantic friendships and the foundation of what a community really is. Um, principles that, are still so important kind of no matter what setting you're in. Yeah, I guess that's kind of how I think about sci-fi in general. It's just like any other, or how I like to see it as like a human story, like any other, it's just the details are different. I mean, like any kind of story, whether it's like in the future or right now, it's like involves a certain amount of world building where it's just like the people take their surroundings for granted they're just kind of like they go about their lives and be who they are and um kind of answering the previous question um like a lot of future perf and my other work in general comes from kind of like an emo personal place it's like i think one of the first ideas for future perf is like oh i feel lonely so it's like what if there was like a place where everybody all my closest friends lived in the same place and it's kind of like <laughs> making this like personal wish list of like what would like a great place to live look like and sort of building on that to include more like socioeconomic concerns but also keeping it pretty like broad because again I wanted to keep it like really people focused rather than maybe like it sounds like Maki or like a wider uh, macro lens sort of these like historical um, things are going on whereas like I think for my characters it's really like what's in their immediate surroundings like like Google and Amazon are fighting in space but it's like they're just like going to hang out because the I don't know maybe it looks cool like a, a meteor shower <laughs> from birth. That's great yeah um you make an interesting point as well, focusing on the individual versus the macro, the historical versus the present. Um, the same setting can yield a lot of different perspectives. When you find yourself approaching these ideas, do you have a tendency to start with any particular aspect of it? Um, maybe uh, drill down on one in particular, or does it sometimes depend? I think it depends if I understand the question. Um, yeah, I think it's like Fiji Perf is set up in a way where it's like a lot of vignettes. So it's really kind of like, I want to talk about this thing right here. And then another story is talking about another aspect and sort of together they 
create like a mosaic of sort of what the larger setting is like. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, four years, it's much less like futuristic sci-fi, but there is an element where the main character, like Betty meets a character who as far as she is concerned is like her four years older. So it's kind of like interacting with a future self to kind of like, oh, that's what it's gonna be like. That's cool. Like there's hope for me. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm like there yet. Yeah. But um, I don't know. Did that kind of get at what your question was? I don't wanna. It did, yeah. And I, uh, I'd love to hear what other folks think as well, um, sort of which angle by which they, they approach these sort of settings, um, they, they start building this world. Yeah, I guess um, I, whenever I create a new story in particular, especially with my short stories, um, I, always, I, I always prefer comics, reading them myself as well, to be character focused, um, because uh, I think the, characters who lead you through a story are like the most important part and they have to be kind of like the um like well, how the world is like how the world exists is kind of like an extension of those characters um and so I always think of like oh what is the like energy or like aesthetic that I want to go with to go like to use in a story and then I bring it back it's kind of like what, what Kevin was saying that their stories is that like Amazon and Google could be fighting in space, but you're focusing on the people on earth, you know, watching it and like how they, you know, perceive it. So like um, in particular, I have a story, um, which is, uh, I have a story in one of the anthologies that I did um, and it's also on my website. It's um, called Old Fashioned Bittersweet. Mm -hmm. And it's a story about a um, character or this bar in like the, not so distant future um and it's kind of like a rundown bar so it's like what would a bar in the future look like if it was like a little bit kind of aged um but still like newer than what we we're having seeing but it's about these two characters like the bartender and the character who comes in and their interactions um and the bartender is a robot or a cyborg android thing and the character who comes in is this person who um has this um like terminal illness and um it feels really weird going back and seeing that story now because of like the character comes in and they're wearing like a face mask and stuff and this is all before the pandemic so it feels like very like I, I went back and looked at that and I was like oh man this is, this is too too close <laughs> to reality um, but it's interesting because it's it's not about the character just being an android or the character being a like um, someone who has this future illness. Um, it's about them, like how they're kind of how they're those things make them interact with each other, mm -hmm. um, and like how they want to kind of connect with each other um, with these things uh, kind of building off of that. So I don't know. I, that's that's kind of where I go with my world building. And I also just listen to a lot of like music and stuff that honestly colors the world that I build as well. So like oh, that no, one was been, yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I loved old fashioned bittersweet because you, you could see a lot of um, sort of the signs of use in that bar, which is amazing because most of the time when these things are depicted, it's very shiny and it's all chrome, and it's all slick. Um, and this is, you know, there's, there have clearly been a lot of visitors to this one place in particular. It was a great detail. So Casey, I'd love to hear more about Body Seed. This, I know that you've been working on it quite a lot and um, I'm, I'm so interested in the world that you're beginning to construct, particularly all, all this sewer related stuff. I'm extremely into this, the sewers. So <laughs> I hate to disappoint you, but the sewers aren't going to be featured heavily in the future. Oh, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> yeah. It's still very change good. That. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah, body seat is weird. Um, it's like, it's stupid because I don't, really feel like I'm trying to hold anything back. Like, I don't really feel like anything's secret, 
but at the same time I'm like what if I reveal too much mm-hmm. but like I don't know if someone wants to post body seed spoilers somewhere <laughs> I'll be complimented um <laughs> but it's like I mean it's very I think I think I wasn't ready to start on it until <laughs> until I actually exposed myself to the work of Ursula Le Guin. Um, Cause I had this story and I didn't know where to put it and I didn't know how to frame it. Cause like fantasy didn't seem like the right kind of thing. And then I like read my first few Ursula Le Guin stories and I was like, well, just do this. <laughs> um, so it's like, it's an alien world and um, everything we see of it though is kind of like uh like classical to medieval Mm -hmm. so it's not like spaceships and stuff Mm -hmm. um but uh there's a lot of there's a lot of details that aren't nailed down but um the land like the land that i will do like a fantasy map of someday is called little cup i don't know why um and i think this is this feels like i mean is this panel more like future world building? Uh, I think that pretty much any world building is game. Um, <laughs> any future that is not the particular future that we have, or you know, it's it, it's an expansive thing. So it's, I'm like asking if I can answer the question. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, um, the thing I am really really proud of. Um, the most that I'm that hasn't been revealed yet actually uh the characters I couldn't help but make them all trans Mm -hmm. because like those are the only people I know anymore um (laughs) and like it just felt natural to me to make it like a sort of trans world because like you know whatever and so I was like I want there to be some form of uh, hormone replacement mm-hmm. but like how do you do that in a fantasy world and then I thought like what if these aliens have like really heavy like pungent hair and they smoke and eat each other's hair as hormone therapy <laughs> um so that's my big idea uh don't steal it <laughs> I'm not even sure it's like I don't know pro- someone probably did that already I don't know yeah, um, there's a lot of like trans fantasy stuff out there that I'm totally ignorant of. Yeah, yeah. CG Perf has some of that, but it's basically just like magic. Yeah. There's like the story <laughs> where they're riding on the bus. It's just like, oh yeah, it's like the power of magical thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like everybody's, I don't know, I'm excited about it. There's a lot of, um, there is like interspecies stuff. So there is actually at some point going to be a human in the story and She comes from the future. She's also trans. Um, And she has like a super advanced cyber womb. (laughs) And that becomes really important. Um, (laughs) um, Yeah. Uh, If I can say one more thing about Body Seed before I shut up, it's um, I started it with that prologue with those two characters who are the main characters. Um, But there's all this history that I want to impart and I was like well I could just do the thing where someone is like reading from a book or like someone just talks about history um but for some reason I felt like really weird about that um and I didn't want to do it and so unfortunately like the next chapter is not going to be about the main characters there's going to be like four prologues (laughs) there's going to be like four chapters of history before I actually get to the story uh, which is why I'm posting it on Patreon because I can't. Who would want to publish? <laughs> who would be like, yeah, sure, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that story structure, but good luck. Um, yeah, uh, and honestly, I think, I think I did that because I'm sort of obsessed with the fact that if you have some character tell you about history, you have to take into account who that person is and where they got that information. And that information isn't gonna be accurate because that's how history works. So I'm like, I have to show the real thing. Mm. Um, yeah, that's body seed. <laughs> it's gonna be 
It's gonna be. I told my dad it's gonna be one of the best comics ever made. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's interesting though. Like you say, uh, with because everyone has their own like biases with how they like tell how something happened or how a story went. So I think that's great to like, I, I don't know, I really love stories that have different perspectives involved. And um, just so you can see kind of like one character may have experienced it this way, another character may have seen it this way, or some people may not have all the information, especially if you're creating a whole world. Like if every character down to like the littlest, like, I don't know, peasant knows all the tiny political details of a world then it wouldn't seem like really weird so yeah yeah like I, I, and honestly like ignorance is one of my favorite things to write about or mm. write I don't know I think ignorance is just like really interesting um and especially when it comes to like a world that is ostensibly like classical to medieval like nobody could read <laughs> you know stuff like that um <clears throat> anyways that's well yeah because i mean ignorance is with with that like you you create the story based on like when characters find new information and like get those revelations so like yeah. ignorance is just a catalyst for more engaging stories <laughs> exactly exactly everybody's <laughs> dumb and i'm gonna torture all of them <laughs> that's fantastic so Casey brought up a great point about uh, the, the stories that we tell that are influenced by who we are as individuals. The sort of flip side of that is what is the pure unvarnished truth? What is the objective reality of what has happened? Uh, and Maki, actually, I've been exploring some of your science comics that have to do with uh, projecting sort of into the future what what um, the results of particular changes might be. I know that COVID in particular, I've seen some work that you've written regarding that. These, these sort of what ifs are such a central part of, I think, science fiction. Uh, and so I'm interested in the what if questions that folks have, have been asking themselves, um, those hypotheticals that they've sort of been working out and being in science, we have some information that we can use to guide those projections. And sometimes we don't. <laughs> Casey, oh, that's yeah. Me. <laughs> right. um, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it, it is a lot for me, it is a lot of, you know, because of my science background, um, I, it's, and it's part of what I love about that cross between sci-fi and science communication because it, 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 you know, I mean, the whole flash forward book is just a bunch of what ifs, you know, what if, you know, what if artificial intelligence made art, you know, is it art, is it, you know, all these like kind of questions to think about. Um, but yeah, and a lot of my work, um, a lot of my work skews mostly towards you know, it's kind of the more rhetorical what ifs of, um, you know, like especially like the the COVID pieces of, you know, not tr not trying to project too much, I guess. Um, you know, because especially with COVID, it's so new. Um, so it's a lot of talking about, you know, you talk about the implications and what experts predict, but you know, as a science communicator, you try not to wax too broadly into the into science fiction um again talking about that like kind of objective um what is that objective you know knowledge versus oh what are we all pontificating and guessing about um you know and it's something that i it's something that's something i do a lot more in my uh fiction work um but not so much in my uh science communication work um mm -hmm. but yeah like just going back to you know my old web comic where one strip they're just you know they need to take a trip down the canal street and they're just in gondola cabs on a canal you know it's an actual canal now kind of thing and just yeah and kind of like what 
Kevin was talking about too, is that, you know, they don't care. They're just, it's just a normal part of, oh, we got to go down the lower Manhattan, you know, got to get on, get on, got to get on the canals. It's just a normal thing. Warehouse is flooded, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I, um, it's not in one of my current things, but in a future project that I'm working on, um, I have the idea of, um, I, I'm working on something that involves the idea of like um, using like photon or like um, like sun based energy um, and like combining that with like esper like psychic mm. kind of like fantasy stuff like that and I'm like okay so what like how would these things interplay and so I got like really interested in like like researching like physics <laughs> and all this weird stuff and like different kinds of energies and things for the project that I'm working on and so that I mean that's that's kind of fun of just like seeing like taking like a random like little idea that you might have and just kind of like expanding it as like far as you can push it <laughs> and just being like okay so I have this idea like how what all kind of like information that I know or I understand can I keep like pushing this one idea and like further and further until it's like I don't know it feels like real science <laughs> yeah yeah it's I've been thinking about that in those terms too because I've just like just finished a project so I'm just, like starting to ramp up thinking about future ones which is its own kind of like sci-fi but like thinking <laughs> about like one idea I'm interested in is like shape-shifting and it's like a story about like a shapeshifter and it's like how would that like play off and like mm -hmm. picking like um references like I really like uh in one of the Tezuka Phoenix books there's like a character called a boopy which is like these little like aliens that can like turn into whatever people are thinking and it's like this whole story about the boopy so it's like how do I make a, a boopy but make it my own <laughs> <laughs> um that's so funny that you brought up shapeshifters because when Alyssa was talking, I was thinking about um, like reflecting on like the real material world and then trying to use like the same sort of logic and apply it to things that don't exist. Yeah. Um, and I was just talking to EJ, my roommate, about Odo from DS9, mm. who is a shapeshifter. And when I was a kid, you know, I like, I like known DS9 from a very, very young age. Like I just grew up with it. And it just occurred to me the other day, Odo has this thing where every 18 hours he has to turn into a liquid and hang out in a bucket for like a couple of hours. And like, ever since I was a kid, I was just like, yeah, of course. <laughs> and, you know, like just <laughs> occurred to me the other day. I was like, oh, they, they had to make that up. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like they made that up and like, it just, it feels right, doesn't it? Like, it feels like, oh, of course your goo gets atrophied after a while and yeah, you yeah. have to go in a bucket. You get, you get tired, you know? Like, right. you, you, you hold a yeah. shape all day and you're just all tensed up to form like a face. Amazing. Yeah. That's like the thing about world building that I think about a lot. It's just like, yeah, you can literally just like say or do anything and it's like with conviction. Cause I just think about like, our real lives just like we walk around like saying like uber and zoom and <laughs> yeah. like quibby seriously it's like yeah that's the thing <laughs> let me call uber like, what yeah, <laughs> but totally it's like that's what somebody named a company i think that is one of my favorite aspects to get into with world building is like the like normalcy of all this stuff i think there's a lot of um like stories that like really overdo it and they make their world building so like for example, like if someone was writing about our future now with like enough, with like bits of information, I would be like, ah, oh, yes, time to hop in my Uber cyber car. And, right. <laughs> and it's like, no, doesn't that, like it's, there's like a certain, like we have all these insane, like supercomputers in our pockets and things like that. But like, we still just like, I don't know, see people peeing in the park and like <laughs> we'd still use our supercomputers to, like look at memes and order chicken fingers or whatever so I, I I think the balance of like um the the natural humanness of like 
how just we exist in the world in in addition to this like these almost like fantastic magical pieces of like advancement and things like that is a really interesting take on um the the future like I remember I was watching this mo- a movie like years ago it was um the new it was Logan the the Wolverine movie and like the thing that I remember the most because it was a movie set in like the near future and like when I was watching it like the thing that like really sold me on the near futureness of this movie was the like initial that car in the beginning of the movie because it looked like what a car would look like 20 15 20 years from now but like a, was built five years before then so it was like a mm-hmm. new car but old and dusty and it looked like this in, and it was just this like perfect like representation of the future because rather than making this like nonsense cyber vehicle it was like a it just looked like a like a built-up Cadillac or something with like way too many fake vents on it or something and but it also had been like driven everywhere so it was like starting to rust and all these things so it was just like it was like the perfect like the the math just added up a hundred percent like no no problems on that I I love that kind of thing it's so fun yeah like the (laughs) fact that we have these supercomputers in our pockets but we still call them phones you know like yeah (laughs) like we've got a little like rotary on them. Oh, yeah, rotary <laughs> i would yeah. die for it like a, a phone case that like had a rotary on it so you could like <laughs> yeah it's fascinating to think about yeah like what we have and like what the limitations are like Alyssa, you were saying like people are still like there's nowhere to like go to the bathroom outside it's like like why and like sort of like unraveling that and just like oh man the present mm-hmm. is kind of fucked up. What's <laughs> what would it be like if that wasn't the case? If, you, if there were public bathrooms anywhere in America, right. you mean? <laughs> yeah, I remember like <laughs> running around cool? Toronto, which is like Michael DeForge like draws a lot of attention to this now. But I was just like, wow, you like the only public toilet I found was like you had to pay fifty cents, and it was this weird like Rabada sized box. <laughs> <laughs> So it's so just like it's like I don't have change. Ah, I'm gonna explode. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's too is like, I mean, we're all still like like animals. Like it's we all still just kind of like we also just kind of want to like pee in the woods every now and again if we need to. <laughs> like uh, even if we do have like robot toilets that might follow us around or something. <laughs> I think there's like a like I think we're never going to escape being like these like physical animal beings in like a world unless like I don't know everything gets turned into concrete (laughs) maybe maybe not but I I think there's I don't know we like we're always going to have that kind of tie to nature and the earth even if like we're in this hyper advanced future but that's waxing I guess (laughs) (laughs) No, I think that's great. And this idea as well that our tendency, I think, in world building is to create the most perfect and the most ideal uh, in all ways. But what ends up happening, I think, in a lot of cases, and actually, as as all of you have explored, is that the one's truest truest self isn't always the most ideal. Um, And so with all the possibilities in front of us, what kind of worlds do we choose to build? Are they the perfect ones or are they our truest ones? Perfection also is so like, it's it's so un, like, what, what constitutes as perfection too? Like, I think a lot of sci-fi like has the idea of technology and advancement as perfection and like the, the closer we can get to this like ideal. It, it's like who created that ideal in the first place? Like, why does that? you know, mean perfection. Um, and why does, I don't know, the, the less lines or how smooth an object is make it more perfect or something. And I think that is um, a type of like science fiction that is, it feels like dated because um, I think we, I, we're seeing more now of people realizing that like the future is, is like, it's not, 
we're not advancing in a straight line. We're advancing in, you know, a jumble of threads all mushed together. And it's, uh, I guess it's a hard thing to just talk about, but um, I, I think once we like lose this goal of like perfection or like trying to find the perfect technology of what would find, what, what would like fix all of our problems. I think it's more about like the different kinds of technology or the different perspectives or the different like cultures and atmospheres and energies and aesthetics that all kind of end up like becoming the future and the future is like I said, it's not a straight line. It's like a, it's like just kind of keeps multiplying. Mm. <sighs> yeah, that, that's so true. You know, like you, I feel like you hit the nail there and that like, you know, the, the issue is that all our technology is advancing at different rates. Um, so yeah, we have supercomputers in our pockets, but the underwear that, you know, automatically collects our, you know, urine and feces and stuff for us, you know, is light years away and possibly never, you know, like, <laughs> I was also thinking about like what the threshold is Who would for want like that? when do we yeah. stop, you know when do we stop calling the supercomputer in our pockets a phone and like with the bathroom thing of like yes the technology's there but when is at what point does it become you know not so much of a pain in the ass that we you know we I feel like there's a I I had this in my head and now I'm going to <laughs> But um, the idea, you know, I feel like there's this like idea that like, yes, there's all this like magical stuff in the future, but you know, there was like probably a long period of time where the technology existed, but people were like, no, nah, not worth it. I'm just going to use a toilet. Yeah. <laughs> right. In that case, that will forever be me. <laughs> <laughs> um, say that now. <laughs> I was going to say about like projecting an ideal future versus like projecting like a realistic future which is like what is that what does that mean um because like the future doesn't exist and we have no access to it so like what what ideal is and what realistic is is not there's like no way to quantify that or actually know it mm -hmm. um but I brought up Star Trek before and Star Trek is like a utopic future where they like explore space peacefully and stuff. Um, and it is like, I don't really think it's simplistic. It's really complicated. There are a lot of like, I learned a lot of shit. There's like, you know, I like learned about the dynamics of torture from <laughs> next gen. Um, <laughs> and they've always made a point in that show to be like, there's no money. Like money has been abolished. So I grew up knowing that a utopic future meant that no money would be there, which has really influenced me to this day. <laughs> um, and I'm grateful for it. I mean, I think Star Trek is right. <laughs> I mean, God, I hope so. I think there are a lot of things about Star Trek that I hope, I hope Star Trek was right on. <laughs> <laughs> hoping against hope that they were on the, on the correct path. So. Mm -hmm. I feel like you could fill an entire other panel with like talking about Star Trek and what it gets right. What, yeah, the hopefulness versus, you know, I, the, I read the most interesting conversation a while back of like people talking about TNG versus DS9 and like the, you know, look, especially looking back at it and like the, the political slants and, you know, talk about like, yeah, you know, like in TNG, they were, you know, supposedly peacefully um, exploring the universe in the biggest warship of the most powerful <laughs> regional power. And yeah, they exactly. still believe that, you know, I believe the, the tweet, I forgot who tweeted it, but their exact words were, you know, they did all this and they still believe that, you know, they're, their words changed hearts. You know? Yeah, and I mean, um, in DS9, I've always thought it was really interesting because like you have the Dominion and it's like this very powerful military organization and they're very, very evil because everyone is like subjected, you know, like everybody is under strict control. And like, I love it as like a dark reflection of the Federation because like sometimes they get up to the same shit. <laughs> um, yeah, what a good show. Yeah, DS9 is my favorite. Yeah, DS9 is also my favorite. I think it's objectively the best. And on that <laughs> note, we are 
almost out of time. We clearly <laughs> need to leave and go watch Star Trek. Um, but I made to- the point I wanted to make, which is that DS9 is best. Right. Thank you for your support, Maki. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to thank all of you for coming in today. This was a great discussion. I've really appreciated all of you. Um, it, uh, you could let us know where to find your work. Um, tell us a little bit about what we can expect from you next. That'd be awesome. Um, you can find my work on my Patreon, patreon.com slash Casey Nowak, all one word, or on Twitter. Just look for Casey Nowak. My handle is dumb and hard to spell. <laughs> um oh geez what am i working on um i'm mostly just working on a bunch of freelance projects right now uh nothing too special uh, i have some stuff coming up in both uh the current issue of the nib magazine and uh the next issue of the nib magazine uh which are always fun so if this is my this is my pitch to support the nib um and get some really great comics uh delivered to your door in a quarterly magazine which i think is really fun <laughs> yeah um, no i also have a patreon it's patreon.com slash maki um and you could see my portfolio on maki if you're interested in all my other work uh, i think i need to update that though to wait a little bit before checking it out <laughs> <laughs> do it later this week or something okay fair um, you can find me, um, honestly, the fastest way is by Googling my name because I'm the only Alyssa Sala, I think, on record. Um, uh, but I'm on Twitter, um, at Solitaire. Um, I'm on, I have my website, has all my comics, all my short story comics. Um, I'll also be tabling at CXC at the end of the month slash beginning of October um, with uh, bonfire anthologies. Um, so we'll have some of our uh, newer books and uh, we'll also be um, taking pre-orders for our new um, physical edition of our newest anthology, um, which we're happy to be able to print because um, COVID has been hard and hit us hard, but we were lucky enough to get a really cool grant from um, the greatest Colum- Greater Columbus Art Council. So um, we will be able to do that. And so we'll be opening pre-orders for that. I'm um, excited. And I did the cover on that, which is, it's a very fantasy cover. So there's your world building. <laughs> um, and then I also am really excited. I have my first um, graphic novel coming out, my full like written in art, all of this, all the works um, coming out in November. It's called um, Weaboo, <laughs> um, not traditional world building. It's definitely mostly set in the real world mostly, um, but it has some world building of the mind. (laughs) (laughs) Who's publishing it? uh, That's published through Oni Press, yes. Okay, awesome. Um, So really excited for that to be out. um, I'm going to buy that. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, I don't have a Patreon like you guys, but uh, I do have a coffee linked on my Twitter if you want to help me buy more coffee from the coffee bus up the street. (laughs) <laughs> well, um, yeah, I am on Twitter, Kevin Chap, K E V I N C Z A P, uh, KevinChap.com. I have a Patreon under the same name. Um, I'm kind of about to drop a couple of things, like uh, the second collection of four years, which will wrap up the story. Um, hopefully, by the time this is viewable, I'll have pre order link up i'm also putting together a zine uh selection of some of my daily comic strips which i've been doing for the past year and then uh more things on the horizon coming out of the uh the pandemic minds (laughs) and uh ley lines we're putting together our next season which will launch in uh january february 2022 so that's going to be very exciting yay Awesome. Well, thank you again so much. It was lovely to have you here. I look forward to reading all of the wonderful things that you're about to come out with. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Alice. Thank you. Thank you.